The topic for today uh, is Webpack. Webpack um, is a module bundler. So I have been working with Webpack since I think last October. So you could say I've gotten okay at it, um, but the learning curve was pretty steep. And uh, I think the problem with Webpack and its adoption is that uh, one, the learning curve, and one, that the people who have learned it forget what it was like to, to switch from Grunt or Gulp and then move to Webpack and then figure out its weird syntax. So this talk basically aims at, uh, it's a beginner level talk. Uh, it basically aims at uh, uh, understanding context around how Webpack came into being and what its position is right now. I'll show you some basic features of Webpack, but nothing too complicated. Uh, so, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Webpack? Oh, all of you. How many of you have written a Webpack config from scratch? Okay, cool. I think my agenda is proper then. Um, so, my agenda for today is for you to understand Webpack and uh, use it whenever it needs to be used at least. Yeah? So, I am Pavitra. Uh, I work at Flipkart.com. I'm a UI engineer there. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, you can tweet me for any questions. So I basically have been working there for a couple of years now. Um, so I started with working on a lot of internal consoles and tools. So I got to play around with uh, with any framework that I could uh, that I wanted to pick. So I got to learn uh, Ember and then Angular and uh, and now React and all this. So Webpack, I came into uh, touch with it. Mm, one second. Can I have the timer thing that you have? Yeah. Uh, so I came into contact with Webpack when I, uh, when I started on a project that had React already in it. Uh, before that, I was working on a legacy app. Uh, OK, you could call it legacy because it's Angular 1. Uh, <laughs> and uh, during that time, I was working on an Ember app also. It was a, it was a console for people to like, um, uh, so people to have better documentation around the company. So the, it had an editor and you could, have, you could manage catalogs and stuff like that. So while using Ember, I didn't really feel the need for a module bundler. It had its own uh, CLI and everything was like good to go. Um, with Angular, mostly we used uh, Grunt and then uh, we played around with Gulp and Browserify, things like that. But still there were shitty problems like, uh, yeah, the concatenation. Um, but Webpack is the thing that you need, in JavaScript at least. That's how I feel. So hope, hope you feel the same at the end of this talk. So uh, first and foremost, let's understand module systems in JavaScript. So it's, the topic is a bit hazy in the, for client-side JavaScript because uh, we haven't had any module system in client-side until ES6 imports. Um, so modules, what is a module and what do, how do you define a module? So module is basically the building block of your application, right? So any kind of functionality that you want to group together, you will put it as a module. Uh, and how do you define these modules? That's the, the, you need to have an interface to define uh, how a module works. Okay. okay I had something there. Huh. So JavaScript. So yeah. So the bad part for us is client-side JavaScript. I made some edits which are not coming anyways. Client-side JavaScript had uh, no inbuilt support for. Um, modules until recently, and we have now ES6 import, ES6 modules. So what did JavaScript developers do for modules? So initially, in the old times, we used immediately invoked function expressions. So they were called with different names, self-invoked uh, things and all. There's a, there's a blog at the end that I've linked which tells you why other things are misnomers and this is the right name. So basically, you have your function and uh, you call it uh, immediately and wrap it in parentheses to make it an expression. 
So this gives you some semblance of private variables. You don't need to put everything in your global and, co and corrupt it beyond uh, any recognition. So you have some private, uh, some notion of private variables, and uh, you can uh, export a variable, export any public functions that you need, and have your uh, library users use them. Library users, or even you could be a client of your own module, right? Um, so, but then we had Node.js. So Node.js came with its own module system, and that was CommonJS. CommonJS, uh, so many of you would have seen the syntax where you require a module. So to use a module for that has been defined in a different file, you, you use require. And if you want to export a module, you say module.exports. Or even if you don't, if you just require, it's going to just run the code in that file. So CommonJS was working only on the Node.js. Now we needed, uh, this wasn't working on the browser, and so people, uh, so we came up with the other, uh, yeah, so that's how Browserify, Webpack, and all of these came into being. Uh, CommonJS was not good enough, apparently. Yeah, so we had uh, AMD also. So AMD mainly wanted to make the syntax asynchronous. So it is kind of similar syntax, how you defi uh, define a library. So this is a uh, named define. So your name is my awesome library. So you're including dependencies uh, which are probably com uh, AMD or CommonJS modules uh, as uh, in that array. And those array values come up in the function with whatever parameters that you define, as whatever parameters that you define. So that was AMD. So AMD, again, your browser doesn't understand it. So you had to use something called require.js. So yeah, there's confusion, there's require in com common JS, there is require JS with AMD, and so yeah, there's the module system is all messed up. Now, we have ES6 modules. Yeah, we don't technically have, but we have Babel. Um, ES6 modules, so ES6 modules have a pretty simple syntax. So you have your default uh, named modules. Uh, um, yeah, you have your default uh, named modules. So when you say export default my module, so somebody made fun of the default, I think, in some tweet. And so yeah, so basically what this does is it exports only one method from your, uh, one um, object from your uh, file, and that will be called my module. So you could name it any way when you import it in other um, files. You could also have named import, uh, exports. So if you export a variable, and that can be imported this way. So ES six modules, everybody understands them and everybody likes them, and yeah, so we are cool cats. So now that we are through the module systems, we need. Uh, so let's get to how Webpack originated, why Webpack was needed, and uh, what are the other alternatives to Webpack, and when did these things come? So yeah. Well, it all started with Node.js. Until then, we were writing, I think, immediately invoked function expressions. So Node.js brought with it a module system, CommonJS, which people used uh, uh, extensively. And then came um, AMD, because they didn't, some people didn't like the syntax. And then came NPM. It is this awesome package manager. So you, you make your uh, libraries, you upload them to this registry, and everybody else can use this registry to download your library and just include them in their projects. So NPM is, I think, one of the things that made people want to have the, the whole module system and the package manager and everything in the browser. Until then, we didn't. So how do you get this into the browser? We got Browserify. Uh, yeah, the name is self-explanatory, I think. Um, yeah, so what did Browserify do? So it took your node code, and it basically defined what require, what the word require in it. So y your node code basically has something like uh, require this module, require this module, and then you write your JavaScript on it. So it basically defined what that require function is for your browser. So Browserify. So the focus of Browserify was basically to convert node code into browser code. Now along with, but Browserify couldn't do other things, it, at that time at least. It couldn't do other things like minifi minification, uglification, which is all very important to us as client-side developers. So we had a spate of some uh, uh, task runners come in. 
um, grunt, gulp, these were at the forefront. Uh, there, were, uh, there are others too, like uh, broccoli, I think, and brunch, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so what did grunt do? Grunt is a task runner. So you define tasks one after the other. You say, uh, you give a task a name, and you say what you want to do within it. This could be just JavaScript. You could call some function. Or uh, you could have, it, you, uh, you have a concept of grunt plugins. So these grunt plugins are basically node uh, uh, functions, which, uh, t which get an input of the files that you want to send, and then they output the whatever is desired, say grunt minification, grunt uglify. So you have all these plugins. So grunt is a config-based um, uh, task runner. So you write a JSON config for this, and then um, uh, you run it. You run the set of tasks. So you be, you define a master task. Say uh, most of most of the time it's called default. And inside that task, you uh, you want to run whichever specific tasks you want. So you could have a set of dev tasks. You can have a set of for pro tasks, test tasks, and so on. And uh, through Grunt, you could have like uh, you could run ca bash commands through it and everything. You can run. So people didn't like, I think, the config-based uh, approach to it. So Gulp became pretty popular soon enough the next year when it came. Gulp does the same thing, but it uh, does it in a different way. You can write JavaScript code, you can chain them together, and you can see that uh, uh, you can. Uh, so it moves through one chain to another. Every task moves from one chain to another uh, as a stream. Easier to debug. Uh, so they became uh, quite popular. But parallelly, there was something called WebMake. So I found this recently, actually. So this guy made WebMake in the similar interest uh, of Browserify. Uh, he wanted to do the same thing as Browserify. But his focus was more on client side. So you, you could use NPM directly on client side. So you wrote all your code on client side. And you compiled it with WebMake. And uh, it would work. Uh, you could use your module systems in this code. So but uh, there was another guy who found a problem with WebMake. He, he wanted a feature called code splitting. So he basically wanted to have, uh, so web, uh, WebMake, is, WebMake is a module bundler. So yeah, I'll tell you the difference between bundlers and uh, task runners later. So he wanted to be able to have different pieces of code, bundled code, to be loaded at different points in your application. He didn't want to load the whole uh, one JS in the script tag and have it have all the code that is required for your application, when probably there are many parts of your applications which may be used co uh, conditionally or even may not be used or used less frequently, and you might not want to load the JavaScript for it, which may be heavy for that part, uh, in the beginning. So WebMake was there, and he tried to he tried to make a uh, push to the uh, push to WebMake to add code splitting features, but that pretty much changed the whole structure of WebMake. Uh, at least that's what he wrote in his first commit, and so Webpack was born. Um, so the difference between what Webpack does and Grunt and Gulp does, I think it is not clear to many people, and it wasn't clear to me. So when I started using Webpack, I looked for like, uh, uh, how do I define tasks? How do I make it do? I looked to order it. How do I, uh, how do I define which uh, folders to look into and stuff like that? But Webpack does not work that way. Webpack is not a task runner. Webpack is a module bundler. So what it looks for is the dependency graph. You give it an, um, you give it an entry point. So the, the starting of your, the main JS or the index JS of your application, which has, which defines uh, its dependencies, and those files define, uh, define their dependencies, and so on. So well, when Webpack receives this, it goes through these dependencies. It creates a huge graph of it the dependency graph, then it sorts this graph into an array, and uh, this array of files concatenates them together. So that's how you have your bundled module. Now, so that pretty much uh, summarizes what I was saying. Webpack is not a task runner. It does not work like Gulp and Grunt. You cannot say, uh, first, I'll, first I'll concatenate, first I'll do this. No, Webpack has its own life cycle. What it does 
it it takes uh, you give it a config it is it's configuration based you give it a config where you define what you want uh, what you want webpack to receive as input and webpack takes this it takes a look at your whole code base it compiles it using a compiler but webpack is extensible at this compiler it defines a life cycle for this compiler and at every point it's a pretty complex life cycle i'm not complex comprehensive life cycle so at every point in this life cycle you can you can have your own functionality so that's how you, if you want to run tasks at certain points of this life cycle then that's what webpack allows you to do and it does it in a different way and a slightly different syntax so that's what its definition is it's a module bundler with an ability to customize any part of it so when he says any part of it is not kidding you can customize at any point in the build process so webpack will take your file it look through the dependency graph it create a bundle then it'll apply certain optimizations over it at each of these points it provides you a life cycle hook and at each of these points you can have your own plugin a plugin is just another javascript uh, method and this could do anything for you in webpack but you need not learn any of this webpack provides a lot of features right out of the box so he has a lot of so the nice thing about webpack is it is also written in that way uh, so if you can write plugins to extend webpack then the, uh, the author has written plugins to even uh, implement core functionality so if you look at the compiler code in webpack it just has a set of life cycles and it says apply plugins at this 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 life cycle and all the plugins do all this uh, impure job of uh, whatever it needs to be done so this is a diagram that they show uh, that's there on webpack documentation so it, it uh, i don't know at first glance how much sense it makes but we, uh, what this diagram is basically trying to convey is two things how webpack uh, bundles all its dependencies and how webpack treats all its dependencies in a similar manner so in this uh, diagram basically you have uh, and this js the corner topmost corner js is your um, entry point to your uh, application then this js has defined uh, dependencies on a jed file and a js file here and this has defined further dependencies and there are interdependencies and so on so webpack looks at this whole structure then it it uh, it breaks it down sorts it and converts it into a structure that is manageable for you and that you can import it you imp import into your html using a script tag so but another thing that this Uh, diagram conveys is that webpack is treating this dot coffee dot css dot png dot less all these files in similar manner as to how it is treating dot js files so yeah that is one of the magics in webpack everything is a module so this can be a little i don't know it's a it's a it's a kind of a different kind of thinking and once you are used to this i don't think you can go back So webpack how do you use webpack webpack comes with it with a small cli so you can uh, do most many things using the command line you need not have the config file theoretically but it is much more simpler to have a config file uh, which ha which uh, in which you can write javascript and like you can debug you can write console log or whatever and fine. so at this point i want to show you a code example so what the syntax says is um, uh you you have you have already done an npm install of webpack so you have the webpack command available this entry.js is the first file that is the entry to your application and the bundle.js is the file into which the uh, completed bundle is put into so this you can define with the with the path also so i'll show it to you so can everybody see this shall i increase the can you see this now yeah so this is uh, a basic example of webpack so what i have in this example is a couple of console logs uh, i have uh, a console log here saying i am now in the index file and then it goes and requires a config.js so the config.js just has another console log saying i am in config and then it comes back to index and it the console logs this so let's run webpack on it and see what happens so i have webpack installed already so what i'll say is webpack uh, and uh, index.js 
So what I want to do with this, how, how, I, how I am going to demo this to you, is that this project, uh, Webpack Examples, has an index HTML, uh, which, uh, which gets all its JavaScript from dist slash bundle.js. So the dist folder here, let me delete it for now. So there's going to be a dist folder on the uh, uh, source folder. So let me delete this one. It's going to be generated by Webpack. So we don't have this bundle.js yet. I'm running a small HTTP server on it. So can I go? Yeah. So currently we have nothing. Yeah. We don't have bundle.js. So let me say webpack index. So my dist uh, uh, folder is going to be above this basic example folder. Uh, if you can see, I don't know how to zoom only this. Yeah, I don't know how to zoom the folder part of it. But yeah, it's going to be outside this folder. So I'm going to do slash slash dist slash bundle dot js. So yeah, so Webpack has bundled this for you. So the output basically says it's taken an index js, it's taken an config js, and it's created a bundle js. The bundle js has a size and stuff like that. So let's try to run it. No? So yeah, so we have our console logs now. So bundle.js got linked, and now we have the console logs in the order that we wanted it to come. So we have I am now in index, then it goes requires the config file, and that, uh, so you will notice that I haven't written any export in the config file, so it just runs the config file, which is print the console log, and then comes back to index.js and does this. So that's a basic example. But this still is very hard to use. I mean, in the CLI, how many commands, how many like uh, uh, parameters will you add to it? So Webpack provides a way to write a configuration. Uh, it is by default called webpack.config.js. So if your configuration is named webpack.config.js, you need not even define this config uh, flag. So this command will run this config file, and in this config file, we will define all our entry points, our output paths, and everything. Let me show that to you. So now I have a basic plus example. This again has the same code. I have an index.js, which says I'm now in index. It's requiring config.js and everything. The only extra thing it has is a webpack config.js. So, yeah. I don't think this part is required. So this is pretty simple. So this is basically what you need to start running Webpack in your application. So Webpack works well with React, but even if it is a pure uh, JS application, this is like the simplest thing that you can have to get a bundle running. So what you do is you define your entry here. Uh, of course, in advanced usage, you can define multiple entries here. Uh, then you define an output, output object. In the output object, you give the path to where you want the bundle.js to fall into, and you give the file name over here. So an interesting thing, oh, okay, let's just run this now. So since it's named webpack.config.js, let's go up. So I have defined some scripts here in my package.json, so I have a clean script which will remove the disk directory. So let me run npm run clean. So yeah, so we don't have it anymore. And yeah, no bundle JS here too. Now let me go to plus sample and run webpack. So it's done it again. So it's taken the uh, all the configuration that you gave in the config JS and it's done it again. Another interesting thing that webpack uh, has over here, I think, uh, I don't know, many people know how. Uh -huh. So you can actually give a hash over here. And uh, save a pack. And it'll generate a new file for you every time. So every time you run this, you have, yeah, only if, the, if there are changes in the code. So it generates a hash of the file, uh, file contents, and then puts it over there. So this helps you in like in production environment and stuff like that. It's a nice pro tip. Um, so, but this won't work with our application, right? So because we still don't have bundle. No, we have bundle.js. I think I did not. I did not clean the disk the first time. I think so. We have bundle and this. So, yeah. So second example is done. Cool. So that's like some basic usage of Webpack. 
Let's look at a com more complex uh, uh, configuration. So the first part of it is basically the same. The con you can see that context over here is a new parameter that I've used. So context basically tells you where, how the Webpack uh, uh, resolver uh, should take, what route the Webpack resolver should take. So for every path that you give here, it'll use this context. So now I have an output, I am putting a bundle JS into this. So public path here is what you could define in your index.html and in production environments you could even define your CDN path here. Uh, now what module have I used? I have used, uh, so we all want to write ES6 code now and for that we need Babel. So uh, Webpack again, so the primary uh, what USP of Webpack is that it treats everything as a module. So you have your ES6, uh, ES6 JavaScript and that is also a module to Webpack. So how does it convert it into a module? So it, be, uh, it uses something called a loader to do anything, to, uh, to convert CSS into modules, to convert PNGs into modules, images into modules, or any templates into modules, you use something called loaders. There are already tons of loaders out there. For any use case that you might have, I think some simple use case, there are a ton of loaders. And if there aren't any for your use case, then you could write your own. A loader is just a function that you have to write. And uh, yeah. So the loader syntax basically looks like this. You have, a, uh, you, have the, you have to define this module parameter. Inside that you have a set of loaders. The loaders is an array, an array of objects, and that, so can, yeah. And that basically has a test. This test is to determine on which files to apply the loader. So if you're applying a CSS loader, you're going to have a test for CSS, and so on. Uh, the loader is the name of the loader. Uh, so th one of the things that confuses people is we npm install babel uh, dash loader but we use babel that's because there is a default for webpack resolver to resolve any loader module with the dash loader at the end so you can just say babel so yeah the one of the gotchas at least and you have to use a preset with babel so babel has uh, various presets defined. So presets are basically a set of uh, transformations that uh, Babel has put into one, uh, I don't know, one, uh, put in one place. Uh, so you have presets for React, you have presets for ES7 and so on. Or you could uh, use the original transformation also. Uh, you can also have uh, the parameters for excluding and including folders. So it basically takes a regex. So in this code, I have excluded all node modules. So no, no mo node modules will be passed or no loader will be applied to anything that you import from a node module. So let's see how this works, right? So I have an example here. Uh, it's called ES6 modules. So what I have here is pretty simple. Uh, I've written some, uh, I've written using ES6 uh, code. So what I say is I import config from .config.js. So config.js just has, uh, it exports, uh, in true ES6 syntax, it exports a, f a variable, a default uh, variable, uh, which, uh, uh, which is an object with the variable title in it. So that's all it does. This main will log that uh, title. So let's look at the webpack config. So it's the same as that I showed in the slide. It has the Babel loader uh, defined here. Now when we run this, npm run clean. Yeah. So we have bundle.js again emitted. So this works pretty well here. We have Babel example printing. So yay. Um, so now you can write ES6 modules with Webpack. Everything is a module. Just reiterating. So Webpack comes along with it uh, with a lot of jargon that was not used before maybe. Um, so mainly people have difficulty understanding this, so I wanted to do a primer on that. So the first jargon that you come across is something called chunk. In Webpack, what does chunk mean? Chunk means a file, a bundled file, 
uh, that Webpack has produced. So Webpack can produce multiple files, right? With, like we talked about, you can have multiple entry points, you can have code splitting and things like that. And each of these uh, outputs that Webpack provides, it will call it a chunk. Bundler. As we said before, Bundler is a uh, is a is a tool that looks into the dependency graph of your code and then concatenates them in keeping with uh, uh, I while respecting this dependency graph. A loader, a loader is basically a transformation that you uh, in Webpack at least a transformation that you apply to your file to make make it into a JavaScript module. Code splitting. Code splitting is to create separate chunks of files to be loaded at different points in your application. An entry point. Entry point is the first level of entry that your Webpack looks at. Uh, it's the place from which it builds the dependency graph. And if you have any more jargon that you don't understand, please tweet me. So another awesome feature about Webpacks is plugins. So plugins allow Webpack to be customized however you want. And basically, it helps you to extend whatever existing behavior Webpack has. A plugin is just a node uh, module. Um, it's just a node function, basically. Um, so there is a syntax to how you have to define this and all that. So once you define a plugin, you attach it to your, you put that in your Webpack config. And the plugin, uh, you define a plugin against a lifecycle um, event of Webpack. So uh, you say compiler dot at e after emitting, after bundling, after before optimization, and so on. You can define plugins at any point of this time. So let's look an e at an example of plugin. So this is my favorite plugin. This is the first plugin I actually understood how it works. Uh, Webpack plugins can be tricky. They're not really named very well. So just by looking at the name, you don't really know uh, what the plugin does. Yeah, they are improving at documentation, but still this <laughs> this was the first plugin that i really understood what it does so when the first time i used it uh, i thought it just generates an index html uh, but what this plugin basically does it uh, takes a template so it could be anything a jade file um, uh, handlebars or anything like that or anything that you come up with and it converts that into an index html um, and it, uh, this is one of the major things that it does. So remember when I added the hash to the bundle. So this hash changes every time you build a web, build Webpack. So how do you get that into your index HTML? You don't know what hash it will provide every time. And you can't keep updating your index HTML. So what, what HTML Webpack plugin allows you to do is inject this hashed file name as a script tag into your uh, application. So it basically injects any assets that are created by Webpack during the build, it injects all of them into the index HTML path that you provide. So let's look at this in action. So I have a different uh, this for it. So the project basically has, it's called uh, Webpack Learning, it has a source folder. I have an index.js. I'm importing a function called do something from a file called do something. Uh, then I run that function. So do something has, uh, it has import styles from style CSS. I have, I have used a style slow, uh, loader here. I'll show that to you. And uh, it exports a function. So what does this function do? So uh, in my, um, so remember when I said HTML Webpack, I have assets, uh, in assets I have an index HTML. This is what will be copied and made to the new index HTML. Uh, so this index HTML just has a uh, head and body and it has a div with an ID root. So I'm going to use that and do something. So I'm going to get the root and I'm going to insert a button into it, which will say I'll fetch a remote thing. Now I'll add an event listener to the button and I will fetch this remote thing using the require uh, async method and run it. Let's see what happens. So remote thing, so remote thing will basically access that root in your DOM. Uh, using jQuery. I've added jQuery also in my Webpack build. And say, uh, I'm, I'm the remote thing and I'm here now. So let's run it. No? We'll delete the existing, I have run it. So the, okay, Webpack config also. I'll just explain this also. So this says, so we have our entry point here. We have um, output here. I'm going to call it bundle.js. 
well, I'm going to have a path called this. The public path is going to be this. Then I have loaders. So first I have my Babel loader. Say, see, you can define it as Babel loader or Babel itself. Both are uh, good to go. Then I have a CSS loader. So what it does is it looks for all the CSS files, passes them to CSS loader, then through styles loader, and makes it ready for, as a JavaScript module. So loaders, you should know, loader syntax is a bit complicated. I mean, we'll not talk about it here. Um, but yeah, that takes a bit of learning. And I have added this HTML Webpack plugin. So what this does is take takes the index HTML from assets. I don't want to generate a new index HTML because then I lose the root uh, div that I had. So I'm going, I have it as a template here in assets and it's going to create an index HTML in the root folder. And it's going to inject whatever assets it creates. So let's run this. It's not here. Okay. So I'll save it back. I didn't try this out this morning, but it runs. Oh, I've used load ash and jQuery and stuff like that. Okay, so what it has done right now, it has created two bundles. So two bundles, why? One, because, uh, two bundles, because I used an asynchronous require, right? So it has basically split my code. So the remote thing, uh, the file inside uh, called remote thing, has gone into a separate bundle and it will be required later when I click on the button. So let's look at how this works first. So I don't think I'm running a server on that. So yeah, first we have the button that's come from, so that, that again shows some requiring. So inside do something, I create a button here. So we have that button here. And we have styles imported because uh, inside styles, I've defined the button color to be blue and we have a blue button here. Now I'll click on this and then we have the content from, uh, remote, uh, from the remote file too. So let's look at the network calls that it made. So first it called, uh, first it included the bundle JS, which was already included in the index HTML. And then it, in, it called one.bundle.js all on its own because Webpack understands how asynchronous uh, stuff should be handled. So we still haven't got to the good part of HTML Webpack plugin. So let me make one change. So now I have bundle hash.js so I, I don't think I let me delete these folders so that we have a so our local host say, does nothing so it's a simple thing so it's showing me the whole uh, file this is not very secure so now let me run webpack again here so it does the same things but it generates, it'll generate the bundles with the hash. Now the interesting thing that we see is that in the generated index HTML, uh, here is the generated index HTML, it has inserted the bundle with the hash in it. That's useful to have. Let's see if everything works. So you have, uh, so it's fetched the first bundle and then it's fetched the second bundle too. So yeah, we got stuff working. So future, so that's about what I wanted to talk about Webpack and its usage right now. So what does Webpack in the future hold for us? So Webpack 2 is in the works right now. It'll come out and thankfully it'll come out with good documentation. Only when we have good documentation will they release Webpack 2. And it will have some interesting features in it. Number one, it will support ES6 modules natively. So for ES6 modules at least you'll not have to use Babel. For any other features you'll still have to use Babel. Um, it will support loading ES6 modules, in, modules asynchronously. Right now, you'll have to use the require syntax to have asynchronous, like I use require.ensure. Then it will support dynamic expressions in ES6 modules. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how it will do this completely because ES6 modules are so good because they are statically parsable and all that. Then it will support tree shaking. So tree shaking is this, uh, I don't know, I like the name a lot. 
is this feature uh, that exploits ES6 modules. Um, so like I said, in ES6 modules, right now we don't have dynamic expressions. So you can rely that whatever ES6 modules exports, uh, you can go through it statically and you can rely that that's what exactly will happen in the final bundle. Uh, so now that you have this advantage, you can eliminate all the code that you're not using. So tree shaking, basically what, what it does is it goes into the dependency tree and in any of those libraries in the dependency, if pieces of code are not being used by, by your application, it'll simply remove them from the, uh, from the final bundle. Uh, this is a great optimization and it will greatly improve your file size. Uh, tree shaking, yeah. So this is about what Webpack 2 will hold. Another topic we have to touch upon while talking about Webpack is its competitors. You have to, it gets compared a lot to these technologies mostly. Um, Browserify, Browserify we spoke about. I think the, uh, so Browserify right now it supports all the features that Webpack has actually. So you want loaders, Browserify has transforms on it and uh, anything that you want to do with Webpack mostly can be accomplished with Browserify. But I find that there is a, fundamental philosophical dif difference between Browserify and Webpack, that Browserify was made to run node code on your uh, browser, while Webpack was made for your browser code. And um, other competitors in the market are right now Rollup. So Rollup, uh, Rollup.js is another module bundler. It does the same thing. It goes through your dependency graph and does all this. But it was the first one to implement tree shaking, and that's because it only supports uh, ES6 modules. Um, Another uh, technology that we should be aware of is, uh, which is gaining traction is JSPM. JSPM is this huge project which is based on a system JS uh, uh, what, uh, philosophy. Uh, JSPM is a module bundler, a module loader, and a package manager all together. So if you have JSPM in your, the, in your system, then you're not doing NPM installs, you're doing JSPM installs. And JSPM, when you say JSPM installs, it has a registry where you have, where uh, uh, keywords are linked to GitHub uh, repositories. So it can install directly from GitHub repositories or even from NPM. So both of these are supported in JSPM. So it's a massive project still in the, uh, still in the works. It can be used if you want to play around with it. And one of the major updates with it is that it has now incorporated roll-up inside it to get tree shaking and other features. Yeah, so that's about it, my talk. Uh, I will update the links in the last slide. So all the resources that I have used to compile this, whatever I've used to learn Webpack, I'll link all of them in the last one. So yeah, that's it, I'm done, I guess. I think we have time for questions. Yes, we do have some time. Hey, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm tr still trying to get my head around uh, yeah. plugins and loaders, okay. even though I use it and mm -hmm. I kind of figure out. But w what's the philosophy? If, if you were to make a choice and you are going to write your own, What's the philosophy behind the distinction of the two? So a loader, uh, a loader usually takes a file as an input. So when you say loader, all it does is transforms a certain file to a different, um, to a module syntax, right? That Webpack can understand and bundle it together. So when you're writing a loader, you'll basically look for an input file to it, you can go through, so this loader is running on your machine, right? So you have all your node uh, APIs available to you, you go through the file, you make any transformations that you require to it, and then you output a file that can be consumed either by another loader or that can be consumed by Webpack directly. So that's when you need to write a loader. When you have a file okay. and you, which is not supported by Webpack or, yeah, which is not, which cannot be understood by JavaScript per se, that's when you write a loader. A but a plugin, a plugin you can write, uh, so a loader, a loader runs at a time when, even before bundling happens, right? So even before bundling happens, you need the file in Webpack, for, in JavaScript format. But a plugin runs at any point in Webpack's lifecycle. So even after your whole application has been bundled, you can, uh, you can have a plugin that say, um, eliminate some code that you don't need or uh, uh, replaces variables. Uh, say, uh, most commonly you have a process.environment variable that you use in your code. So you want to replace with true if it is production and if it is not. You can define such things in your plugin. So at different points in the Webpack lifecycle, you can have plugin do things to it. 
So uh, mainly one like simple example would be if you want to log when, uh, whatever Webpack does. So at each life cycle, you can write a log inside a plugin. And then while, when it's running, you have nice logs which are giving things. We have one more question. Drawbacks. Yeah, like uh, uh, currently you are just putting the CSS in the head and when you are rendering, you can see the UI quickly. If you are bundling the CSS with the webpack, the problem is if your bundle is 200 KBs, then it will take a lot of time to render the initial UI. What so there is a plugin for that too. So if, you, if your main problem is that you do not want the CSS mixed with your JavaScript okay. code, so there is an extract text plugin. I know this name is weird. But the plugin, what it does is, when you define your loader, you say extract all the CSS out of the JavaScript file. So what it makes is it makes a separate bundle of all your CSS in the end. You can you, you can look at the plugin. I can give you the link if you want. Okay, okay. Uh, it's the same question. Like uh, I'm writing Angular 2 application, so what are you suggesting? Should I go with the Webpack or System JS? I think they're going to have Webpack by default, right? No, the, uh, most of the applications are written with the System JS system in Angular JS. 2. Actually, I have not played too much with System JS. I've I've seen a couple of talks and I I did install JSPM and all and tried it. But it seemed a bit more work to me, at least after learning this, you have your, uh, so you have another config to learn over there and that installs, so, so I don't know, I, do you use NPM, when do you use NPM, when do you use JSPM, uh, it was not fully clear to me. Uh, I should say I though I haven't done a deep dive into it. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, just hold on, let's get the mic to you. Can you stand where you are? Oh. you do the live debugging uh, after so i i didn't want to show it here because it's it's too much of code and it is like hard to set up too but uh, mostly live debugging and hot reloading works very well with react uh, and uh, if you follow the instructions on the webpack documentation it will work like you said the transformation and all they are applied mm -hmm. And so that's what Webpack has a plugin called Hot Module Replacement Plugin. So what this plugin does is it creates those. Check, uh, check, check. So how does live debugging check, happen? Check. So you have a copy of all your files, and uh, uh, basically there is uh, the final rendered thing is another um, a wrapper over this copy, right? So only this when you change any code, this copy changes, and this wrapper doesn't change, and it pulls in the new changes. So that's something the philosophy behind it. So Webpack has a plugin to do that to create this wrapped. Uh, uh, components. So that's how you can get live debugging working. And do you recommend uh, with React uh, Webpack? Yeah, works very well with React. Because React, you cannot use any other now, right now, modeling, module system. Okay. Thank you. Uh, small update, we have the internet working now, thankfully. So uh, we've got also, just to draw your attention on this beautiful writing of mine here. So you've got the network ID and what the password is. That's JSC at 2016, JSC in capitals. Um, we've also started actively using just one hashtag for the day, which is hash JS channel conf. So uh, you know the Twitter handle already, but then start retweeting or tweeting whatever your feedback, thoughts around the speakers are on JS channel conf. Thank you. We'll take just one last question. Uh, quick question. Uh, yesterday, Yahuda explained about critical path uh, JavaScript and CSS and checking out everything else in the uh, service worker. So does Webpack uh, give this feature out of the box? No, currently doesn't, at least of my knowledge. When we are using service workers, uh, we have it, uh, we have separate code for running it. Uh, Yahuda, any other tool that does that? <laughs> yeah, how will Webpack give service workers out of the box? I uh, so I don't use Webpack, I use um, Ember CLI, as you know. Uh, no, so I'm asking, if not Webpack, uh, any other tool that does that? That does which thing? Uh, figuring out the critical path JavaScript and CSS oh. and checking out everything in Service Worker. Yeah, so I talked about this in my talk yesterday. So um, Ember CLI is working on this stuff. No, besides we, Ember. Um, so I think, I think the main, you talked about Rollup, which is like, pro, I would say if you're not using, if you're not already using a tool like Webpack, then you can use Rollup with any other tool, and that will do a pretty good job. Uh, obviously, you have to configure it yourself, but that's why people use Webpack or Ember CLI. Yeah. So, cool, yeah, I'm done. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions about Webpack, don't uh, hesitate to tweet. I will try to answer them. 
Mm, thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you.